Hello and welcome to the state of blockchain security here at the Blockchain Village at DEF CON 28. I'm excited to share with you just a really zoomed out view of the current state of our industry. Uh, we'll talk about a variety of blockchain security related events, major incidents. Uh, we'll gather some insights and make future predictions. And most importantly, we'll talk about a lot of opportunities, how to build a stronger and more trustworthy um, financial system. So in case we have not met, my name is Peter Kaczorginski. I'm a blockchain security engineer at Coinbase, uh, where I spend most of my time trying to break and secure a variety of standalone blockchain systems and smart contracts. Um, on the side, I also publish a blockchain uh, threat intelligence newsletter where I share the latest news. And partially, I will be recapping some of the major events that I cover in that newsletter. Uh, and in the past, I was also organizer of the Capture the Coin competition uh, at DEF CON. In the past, I was working also as a malware reverse engineer at FireEye. If you're a malware reverser, you may have run into a few of my tools, such as Flare VM and FakeNetNG. Um, and I've also reversed a whole lot of APT malware uh, that I care to remember. Uh, Zooming even back out, I, I was more on the offensive side as well for the Federal Reserve System, where I was working as a penetration tester, trying to break finance 1.0. I guess everyone shares their story of how they got into crypto. Uh, the revealing moment for me was just basically my past growing up in the Soviet Union and observing what hyperinflation means in the first place. Uh, so it really, um, it really uh, stroke a chord in me when I understood what what are the uh, what, are, what are the future offered by the cryptocurrencies. And I take it as a personal mission to make this field succeed by making it more secure. And I hope you join me on that mission as well. So what are we going to talk about? Um, I would like to help inform, educate, and identify as many opportunities for you as possible. So if you feel like this is the field for you, you will, be, you will know exactly where to plug in and what to pursue. Um, within, uh, this talk, we're going to talk about a variety of incidents, as I mentioned, from the newsletter. Um, but the key point here is that it's less about me being right. I will offer some insight and opinions here, but I'm even more excited to start a discussion and learn from you during the Q&A session or offline if you care to reach out. Uh, I would be highly excited to hear uh, your thoughts on it. Uh, in our presentation, we'll begin by defining the field in the ecosystem. So we'll talk what is blockchain security, what are, how is it different from you know, any other uh, security uh, disciplines, let's say web application or IoT security, what makes it unique. Uh, we will also uh, talk about the overall ecosystem that we're trying to protect and also think how it's getting attacked. Uh, next, we're going to break down uh, all of the um, a variety of the components within the blockchain security field. So we'll talk about exchange security, what were the major incidents this year so far? What can we learn from it? Uh, we're going to talk about the asset security. So we, we will discover a variety of protocol issues that are being exploited. We'll talk about software getting attacked, other weak points. And last but definitely not least is user security. We're going to deep dive into the main point of why we're building this is for the users, for people to be able to transact securely. Um, we will finish the presentation with uh, thoughts about building this industry, how to make it more mature, um, what we can do to um, share the guidelines to that people can just pick up and implement in their next projects, the tools that still need to be developed, as well as how we can build up our community. So let's begin first by defining what is blockchain security. Um, I believe it's a brand new field. It's a new discipline of uh, information security uh, with a mission of securing and defending the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Uh, what is cryptocurrency ecosystem? We, again, I mentioned users are at the core of it. We have uh, a variety of assets, both uh, layer one and layer two, so smart contracts and all of that. So nodes, wallets, smart contracts are all within the scope of this field. Of course, exchanges, uh, a variety of people choose to uh, delegate and uh, use centralized points of uh, storage in key, uh, instead of holding all the keys themselves, uh, and a variety of attacks and impl security implications that that brings, including uh, what are the issues with cold hot storage, uh, the incidents that are happening in this world, and, and other issues. 
Uh, so some of the threats that we'll cover throughout this talk, we'll talk a lot about malware, uh, just because of my background, we'll, we'll cover how it's affecting both the assets where they're getting backdoored, uh, uh, malware attacks against users themselves, the ransomware and the miners and all of that good stuff, as well as how it affects exchanges. We'll go through fraud and scam schemes that are perpetrated against users. We'll talk about what are the losses, what can we do to defend ourselves against it, make users feel a little bit more comfortable and safer. Um, we'll talk about network attacks. So we'll dive into nitty gritty technical details of attacks against uh, a variety of different uh, chains and lessons that we can learn from them. We'll talk about phishing attacks against exchanges and users, and definitely about bad actors. Who are the people behind those threats? What can we learn and how we can better defend ourselves against them? So let's first dive into the exchange security. Um, for, I mean, last year, if you've been paying attention in 2019, there were so many incidents when one exchange after another was falling down with millions and millions of dollars lost from the hot wallet theft. This year, what I'm observing is something different, uh, is that we're seeing two incidents from BlockFi and CoinCheck where the attackers chose not necessarily to go after the, you know, just grab the coins and run off. Instead, they were content with just getting to um, PII data. So we're talking about emails, addresses, other personally identifiable information from the customers. So uh, the, the first incident that I'm going to cover is BlockFi and the, they were good at publishing the incident report fairly quickly. However, uh, what they described as the reason, the root cause for the attack is that one of their employees was simported, simported to access the internal portal. So this sounds like a, something preventable. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're defending your, simp, your uh, internal portal with, uh, with a phone, with the, you're using 2FA, that, which is like a, some kind of SMS or a phone system, uh, it really could have been improved. It's something that could have been avoided. Similarly, CoinCheck reported a loss of 200 customer, uh, uh, 200 customer uh, piece of data, PII data. And again, the, the root cause for it was the main registrar was hacked. It's something that could have been avoided by maybe picking someone more secure or uh, trying to find a way how to secure your registration so it wouldn't be hijacked as easily. And of course, this year we had, you know, good old hot wallet theft. So the year started with Altspit with really tiny um, uh, financial loss. It was only six, uh, six, seven Bitcoins stolen and 23 ETH. Uh, Lulsec took uh, credit for this compromise. Unfortunately, the exchange shut down as a result, but, and so we don't really know as much information about what caused it, what was the underlying issue, um, but it just continues on the trend from last year that these things happen. And this happened early in the year, I believe in back in January. A more recent incident was from the Kasha exchange, which reported a loss of 336 Bitcoins. And again, the reasoning that they described was that their employee was using a personal laptop to conduct um, official business. So they were running OTC desk from their personal machine, which apparently got malware on it, and the attacker was able to get away with the keys. Again, something that could have been um, avoided. So some insights, some observations that we're seeing so far. Are exchanges getting more secure? I think so. We, we're observing a decrease in the number of incidents. Back in 2019, it was absolutely insane where we had multiple exchanges sometimes compromised within a single week. So far, we're seeing four exchanges with only two of them, resulting in a direct monetary loss. Speaking of damage, uh, financial damage itself, uh, the total amount of loss was in 175 million. Back last year, we almost had, six months in into the year and the total losses so far only $4 million. So the financial damage is going down. What's also very interesting to see is that folks are very open about the compromises. They release incident reports within 24 hours. They tell you exactly who, uh, who is affected, what, is, what was the issue. Uh, so that response is just really good to see. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the types of incidents, they could have been really easily avoided. Uh, SIM swapping, that could have been locked down ahead of time. The uh, run, letting people, employees run um, official work on unmanaged personal laptops is just a very risky thing to do. 
another trend is the is the attackers going after more than just hot wallet, not more than just the coins themselves. So I imagine that whatever PII they stole on one day, uh, come Monday, they will turn around and try to perform uh, SIM swapping attacks. In fact, there was an article, I believe, where there was an interview with the attackers where they explicitly said that, well, you know what, we could, we, the best way for us to monetize is to actually just to start SIM swapping instead of trying to sell that data or using any other type of attack. So this is something we may see more in the future. Uh, next, let's talk about the asset security, specifically uh, security of the protocols. Like we're talking about the interaction between different chains and nodes and all of that. Well, the best example are the variety of 51% attacks, which have been always happening and will continue happening. I first will cover two incidents with Bitcoin Gold. So the first incident was back in January 23rd and 24th. So there were in fact two 51% attacks uh, back to back. It resulted in a uh, 29 block reorg, which is fairly sizable. And it definitely resulted in a double spin. So this is unfortunate. This is something that we, we observed um, happening uh, for a while. Any coin which is using, which is a relatively lower hash power and, and uh, has a hash power available for sale that you can easily rent on something like NiceHash is getting 51% uh, attack. What's interesting is the second incident on July 10th is that the attacker apparently once again tried to rent out the power, uh, some hashing power on NiceHash. Uh, but in this case, the miner who rented out their capacity apparently figured out they're doing something bad and was able to notify Bitcoin Gold developers. So what they did in, uh, to, in response to that was fascinating and potentially a trend for the future is that they contacted miners in secret and uh, distributed a uh, modified piece of node software which had a checkpoint. That checkpoint essentially invalidated whatever new chain that the attacker was mining in secret. So what happened was once the uh, once the attacker actually published the reorg chain, it was not accepted by the network. So they wasted all their money on on NiceHash and all their efforts. Um, Bitcoin Gold published their um, uh, report about what happened, what they did to defend the network. Um, but this is this is concerning uh, in. And well, and this is interesting also in two ways. On one side, it's great that the they were able to catch it, but this was only done because one of the nice hash miners was uh, uh, vigilant enough to be able to notify them. So this could have been just as easily missed. Depending on how you view those networks, introducing checkpoints into your protocol, uh, secretly communicating with miners, it depends on your specific looks and on decentralization. That may be considered by some as something that we don't want to see. But it's it worked in this case, and we'll in fact see later on when we talk about Vertcoin, it is once again something that repeated where uh, developers of Node software are communicating with um, miners in order to se help secure the network. Another interesting trend about this particular attack is that the rework was massive. It was 1,300 blocks reworked. So the attackers are willing to spend and invest significant funds into their attacks. In fact, the most recent uh, incident, which is still ongoing, is starting on August 1st, uh, is a massive 3,500 block rework, uh, the first of, of two, uh, where an attacker apparently spent uh, more than 200K on NiceHash to rent capacity in order to double spend an exchange. So in this, I'm, in the slide, I'm only listing the first incident. There was in fact yet another reorg attempt, re successful reorg attack, on, 51, uh, on the Ethereum Classic network uh, with a f another massive 4,000 blog reorg. So some of the insights in this is that uh, these types of attack will continue. Any coin which, is, which has easily rentable GPU capacity uh, that you can rent on NiceHash or something that you can repurpose from another coin, they, they, are, they will be attacked. They're, they're under a risk of getting attacked. Uh, what's uh, another interesting observation what Bitcoin Gold, Gold did with working with miners and kind of trolling the attackers by not, not saying ever, to everyone, like, hey, we're, we know there's an attacker and they're about to release their, uh, uh, their secret chain any time now. They actually waited for the attacker to waste their capacity and their funds to until they, uh, 
until they found out like, wow, okay, this was all wasted effort. So what I covered before were traditional 51% attacks against proof of work networks. Um, what's interesting happening on the blockchain networks today are is that there's a trend towards shifting into proof of stake um, consensus algorithms. So what I'll cover are two different coins, so Steemit incident and the Ethereum incident, and explain how they're potentially trend setting and uh, something that we may see more in the future rather than just more and more 51% attacks. So on the Steemit side, uh, I guess just, just summarize incident, uh, Justin Sun from Tron purchased the Steemit coin. Uh, there was uh, a disagreement over how to manage uh, vast assets of frozen funds that were initially pre-mined since the beginning of Steemit. Um, the way that this disagree disagreement was addressed was not through negotiation and trying to find some kind of uh, agreement, but in fact, it was uh, uh, on the Tron side, uh, they decided to attack the coin by taking over its uh, uh, delegated proof of staking algorithm. So if you're familiar with the proof of stake algorithm, uh, the more coins you have, uh, you can take those coins, you can free, uh, lock them up somehow to give you some voting power. So you can, uh, this is what's called staking in order to produce blocks or vote for whatever um, unchained action. So some coins use uh, governance uh, for that. In the delegated proof of stake systems, uh, you, don't, you, you don't vote for uh, blocks yourselves directly. Uh, something, for example, in ETH 2.0, you need to lock up 32 ETH and you can vote on blocks and can validate blocks. Uh, with delegation, you in fact delegate um, a set of validators and you empower them and you entrust them to uh, validate and produce blocks. So this is the system used in Steemit, EOS and other coins. So what happened in this particular incident is that Tron um, colluded with a number of large exchanges, which were holding uh, vast amounts of Steemit coin in order to gain the controlling package of the asset. Once they got that, they were able to vote in uh, a controlling set of validators, which allowed them to basically control the network. They were empowered to set what are the consensus rules. Once they gained that right, they were able to push an updated node software, which unfroze uh, through a, basically a hard fork, unfroze those uh, funds, which were from the initial pre-mine, which absolutely gave uh, uh, Tron a controlling uh, package of, of the asset in the system where no one can really challenge them and they were able to hold on to their power uh, indefinitely. Taking the ethics aside, there, there are arguments uh, on both sides that you know, why did this have to break down into a technical attack when something that could have been agreed upon just by uh, uh, dialogue? What's interesting about this, this is the first case of a proof of stake attack uh, and we could see how it played out. Uh, what's, was, the way that it played out is was very quickly. Between the time that Tron was able to get the controlling package of uh, Steemit coins to uh, pushing their own set of validators to pushing a hard fork to unfreeze funds, to taking those funds and uh, you know, multiplying how, many, how much voting power they have. It didn't take months or even weeks, it took hours. So it was a highly coordinated attack. It was executed very precisely and effectively. Um, so this was a fascinating example. On the Ethereum side, uh, we're, again, Ethereum is something that has massive hash power, so we're not gonna see, highly unlikely, we're gonna see 51% attacks, but there's still a variety of things that people do, uh, for, such as mempool manipulation. When, uh, when there was a black swan event, when the price of Ethereum went crashed, uh, and a bunch of MakerDAO auctions were starting to get liquidated, there was apparently a mempool attack where they try to cause a high degree of congestion so that, uh, uh, some individuals were able to create a number of uh, liquidation bids at for nothing at zero zero bid liquidations and be able to win them because they essentially did not have any competition because the network was congested. This is this is very interesting approach. We've seen mempool attacks before, but this is interesting how we are um, manipulating the underlying protocol, underlying Ethereum network, in order to attack uh, 
higher level smart contracts and DeFi projects as well. So some network security insights from what we've seen is that Steemit, uh, that opens up a new era of proof of stake attacks and governance attacks. Instead of being worried that someone will buy up a whole bunch of miners or mining capacity, hash power capacity on NiceHash, now the power is in the exchanges. So exchanges control the most coins, exchanges colluding together may decide to attack a, uh, a chain. So this is something that we have to uh, be on the lookout for now. Attackers are getting more creative as well. So mempool manipulation in order to attack a, a DeFi a project uh, is, is something interesting that, that we'll likely see as well. Let's switch gears a little bit. And instead of talking about asset security on the protocol side, let's talk about the underlying software itself. In the end, it's, it's all abstract. It, it all works in the cloud. But what's actually working, the actual logic and code that runs is in node software itself. Um, nodes are complex uh, pieces of, of software, and the inevitable that they will have bugs and vulnerabilities. So a few interesting incidents that I want to cover uh, so far this year, uh, two of them happen on the testnet. So I'll start from left to right. So the Solana network, uh, there were no issues in the protocol itself. So the design, I believe it uses um, a BFT-like system. Um, the issue was in the implementation. There was a flaw, there was a, a vulnerability in the way that it failed to, uh, the no node software failed to validate transactions, which essentially allowed somebody to print 500 million uh, Solana coins. Um, on the, on the mainnet project, so the Tendermint, this is the underlying consensus library used by projects like Cosmos and others. Uh, a denial of service vulnerability was discovered, which essentially allowed someone to uh, halt the entire network. Uh, and again, this was done not because of some flaw in the product protocol, it was because of uh, nodes failing to validate um, specially crafted blocks. Uh, the last example is the inflation bug. Those are particularly dangerous because they affect the entire ecosystem. Uh, luckily, this one was discovered again on the testnet where 9 billion file coins were minted. Uh, this was patched uh, and did not affect the mainnet. But you can see like the, the vulnerability, there are only three examples that I'm listing here, but uh, the vulnerabilities in node software can have severe implications for, for the market. On the wallet side, again, uh, any piece of software will have vulnerabilities. Uh, Monero wallet uh, failed to validate specially crafted uh, transaction, Coinbase transactions to be specific, uh, which resulted in it appearing as if you, were, you received more of Monero than was actually sent. Uh, this is something similar to, if you recall, there were a whole bunch of exchanges compromised with the Ripple. Uh, uh, there was a special flag, which is basically telling you how much you are uh, vouching to send as opposed to how much you actually are going to send. So there's a potential for um, uh, exchanges or individual uh, wallet owners to incorrectly credit um, uh, whoever is sending them funds. Lightning Network, it's still very much alpha system. So it, it continues to have vulnerabilities discovered and patched. There's a lot of, there are a lot of papers getting published. So this is actually a good sign that people are looking into it and finding uh, flaws early on. Um, now, Argent Wallet, uh, that was an interesting bug that was responsibly disclosed by Open Zeppelin and uh, effectively patched by the Argent folks, is that it allowed, it allowed users to basically create a kind of recovery mechanism using specialized guardian uh, uh, nodes. And in rare occasions when such nodes were not properly defined, it allowed anyone to take over those wallets. Once again, this was patched, but an example of vulnerabilities in wallets. Uh, what's more interesting are not the vulnerabilities that are discovered and patched. Um, this is normal. Uh, what's more interesting are intentional backdoors that are introduced in both wallets and node software. So the first incident I'm going to cover, it happened in the Trinity wallet. Um, and the way that uh, we've seen, we've seen backdoored wallets for a while uh, last year, uh, I talked a lot about the Electrum wallets getting backdoored. The way that they the, the way they attacked the Trinity wallet was not directly, not going by after the main repository itself. Instead, they were going after the um, uh, third-party dependency. 
So the third party dependency on which Trinity Vault was relying to was patched to steal users' keys. That was included in the main repository and any user downloading and using this was heading at, had his assets stolen. Ravencoin um, incident was even more vicious. Uh, on July 4th, an inflation bug was discovered and an emergency patch was issued to uh, a variety of nodes uh, and, and uh, distributed to miners. Um, and this is something that initially maybe it was just a vulnerability. Every once in a while you discover those things um, until the point they realized that the bug was intentionally introduced. It was introduced back early in the year in January um, by an account which was a throwaway GitHub account. It, the patch appeared to be very um, innocent looking um, um, commit which allowed you to be more verbose about the type of errors that you're getting. So it snuck by um, uh, the, the core maintainer's eyes. They were not able to detect that. And for months now, they were slowly minting. There was a script running that was slowly minting uh, RVN coins. So a total 300 million RVN coins were minted over time and unfortunately also sold on exchanges. So this was a successful um, inflation bug that was maliciously introduced and exploited. Uh, these are particularly scary, and I'm sure we'll we'll see this again and again because they attack the whole ecosystem rather than individual user or piece of software. So some insights on node and wallet uh, software security. Um, vulnerabilities are still very rare. Uh, we only talked about four flaws here, and one was introduced intentionally. The question and challenge to you, do we really have enough eyes looking at nodes looking for the vulnerabilities and being able to patch them. There are bug bounties which are available, but I wonder if there are enough participants and enough folks which are really uh, pushing the limits of how secure that software is. Ravencoin stealth commit and Trinity supply chain threats. This will likely happen again. Um, attackers are highly motivated. There's a direct financial profit in attacking uh, these pieces of software. So this will likely repeat. So switching gears a little bit on the layer two issues, which is smart contracts, um, that's even more concerning. Uh, there were, I mean, I'm listing here 10 incidents. There was one more that happened in the last few days, which is not included here. Um, as DeFi projects are getting more and more popular, uh, the vulnerability, this is complex software, which once again has a lot of different vulnerabilities, which are constantly getting discovered. I'm not gonna cover all of these, just it would, take a whole hour on its own, but I'll focus on just three of these. So we'll start left to right. Uh, the first incident that basically opened the year was the BZX DeFi project uh, back in February. Um, and the way that it started out was there was a margin trading vulnerability that was exploited, 1 million worth of ETH was stolen. What was interesting about this particular incident is that the use, the, uh, the attacker used flash loans in order to amplify the attack. Flash loans is basically um, a mechanism where you can borrow X amount of an asset and return it back to the in initial point uh, all within the same transaction. So you're paying non-existent or minimal fees for doing that and allows you to execute an attack in between since you have all these assets available to you in order to execute the attack. So this kind of defeats a, a kind of a paradigm that we had before where we think that if we if, it's, if it costs so much money to attack something that is highly, that would makes it more, less likely that someone will actually execute the attack. But with flash loans, attackers have really minimal um, risk to uh, basically the transaction reverting, then so be it, they don't lose anything. And they, they can return those funds and whatever they loaned and uh, they don't really lose anything. But if they win, then they win big. So in this case, they won $1 million worth of ETH. Um, and we start seeing this flash loans approach happen again and again throughout the year uh, from this point on. Um, another incident which is interesting to note is the balancer project. So again, 500K was drained from multi-token pools. This one is interesting because it wasn't the vulnerability in the balancer um, smart contract itself. It was in the way that one complex project was interacting with another complex project. 
in this case, the developers could not uh, predict that you could use uh, deflationary tokens, which um, change the logic to the attacker's advantage. Um, so when on its own, like in all of their testing with traditional token systems, then it's, it works as expected. So this is something that is well known in the traditional uh, computer security practice and something that needs to be applied to DeFi projects as well. Another gotcha in this one is that the vulnerability was reported in a bug bounty report. So the good news is bug bounties work. Uh, I think a lot of the projects in the DeFi space do have bug bounties. It's just, it's very hard to triage those things, very hard to find the ones which are um, real examples of an attack and or which ones are not as good quality. So this is, this is uh, something to keep in mind when running your own bug bounties. Uh, the last example, uh, and again, this is something that uh, example here repeated in other incidents, is a Bancor project where uh, developers were notified uh, that they had a vulnerability, so they learned there was an issue. Uh, and the way that they approached to, to protect their users is by attacking their own coin, their own um, uh, smart contract, with the same ways that an attacker would, is just that with the purpose of actually preserving user funds. But what was interesting here is that arbitrage bots, apparently uh, their uh, piece of software con constantly monitoring the Ethereum network, seeing that if there is some large, uh, large uh, activity happening and it starts automatically replaying it, trying to um, make a arbitrage opportunities, exploit arbitrage opportunities there, picked up on developers trying to secure users funds and were automatically able to exploit the project in the same way that the developers were doing it. So it's fascinating to see those um, automated piece of software that just piggyback of um, existing attacks. So some insights on the layer two smart contract security. Uh, this is gonna be the year of DeFi hacks, uh, both in the, the amount lost um, the number of vulnerabilities discovered. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the number of incidents is on the rise. Uh, so it will likely continue seeing that this year. Uh, the bug bounty programs, they work and developers are catching bugs early, which is a good sign. And I'll explain you why in a bit when we talk about tooling and guidelines. Um, but the interesting trend to use by Bancor is that we often have to hack ourselves to secure funds. Complex code will continue having bugs and uh, complex interactions between different projects are also something that we need to think about as this is the whole point of DeFi is that you're, you're creating links between vast smart contract projects out there. So I promised to talk about user security and we had a few major incidents that we're gonna cover shortly from Twitter and so on. Um, but this is this is uh, it's not sometimes it's not as exciting of a field to look at, but just as critical as any other uh, discipline. So we're going to talk about cryptocurrency malware, uh, variety of scam uh, and fraud schemes, uh, as well as just talk a little bit like who are the bad actors, who is doing that, who are the new players in this arena now. So first, let's talk about the uh, crypto mining malware. Uh, and this is how I got into partially into cryptocurrencies is that essentially for a year I was reversing nothing but uh, ransomware and crypto mining uh, samples. Um, for on the crypto mining side, it was always the Monero folks. They are uh, setting up their minus XM rig into anything that can possibly run XM rig. So if they can run it on toasters, they probably would run it on toasters. Uh, so far this year, it's not as bad as uh, you know Russian scientists running nuclear stations, uh, mining on nuclear stations, uh, but still five EU supercomputers were hacked in order to run Monero miners. We had multiple issues with Docker where uh, attackers were scanning vulnerable API uh, endpoints to take over existing Docker images or just publishing their own backdoored uh, Docker images on the Docker hub, which would also uh, mine uh, Monero in the background. And of course, there's just never ending stream of uh, Windows um, desktop malware. Uh, one example is Lucifer, which is just, it's an arsenal of 
um, uh, there was a whole exploit kit built into it, which can self-propagate, attack other Windows machines, and spread on its own. So on the ransomware side, it seems like this this is an ongoing threat. I'm not sure yet if the uh, if the trend is going down yet, but uh, so far we had UCSF, which was attacked for 100 Bitcoin or so. Travelex earlier this year, 285. Um, just a few days ago, we learned that Canon was attacked with ransomware by, I believe, the Maze crew. Uh, we don't know. They're, they're known to ask for Bitcoin as a compensation, as a ransom. So we'll find out when, when, the, when the incident concludes. And of course, it seems like every city in Florida is getting uh, ransomware on their, on their machines. So an example, a city of Riviera had to pay 65 Bitcoins to get their systems back online. Yeah, so this sucks. This is unfortunate. This is this is a threat that we have to worry about, uh, especially on systems like UCSF uh, in the time of COVID. But um, this is something we'll continue seeing. Monero miners will hack anything uh, available to them to get um, to install the crypto mining malware. Uh, ransomware appears to be on the decline, but it's too early to say we're still only halfway through the year to to establish a trend. Crypto giveaways, uh, well, I mean, we all talked about the Twitter hack, which was absolutely epic. I don't want to steal uh, Victor's uh, keynote presentation uh, tomorrow, uh, but he'll dive into more details. But just to summarize, 130 uh, uh, accounts were hijacked on Twitter from exchanges to celebrities to corporate accounts. Uh, the way that were hijacked is that the attackers were able to basically get access to the internal tools through social engineering of Twitter employees. Uh, and that's kind of fascinating. Like the best thing they could think of doing it was, was, was running a BTC giveaway scam. Um, so on one side, this is really bad. On the other side, it could have been much worse. Uh, Elon Musk is getting no break from, uh, from YouTube scammers. So anytime you see a SpaceX uh, feed, there's likely gonna be send BTC notes everywhere. So sorry, Elon. Uh, MLM scams are still continuing on as before. So we started with the BitConnect and moved on to 4 billion enterprise of PLUS token. And now the latest and greatest is Chinese police just busted uh, Woe token scammers uh, who managed to get $1 billion uh, worth of crypto from 700,000 victims. What's more interesting is uh, not just the uh, the existing scams or the ones that I covered before, but the trends of what are we going to see uh, attackers experimenting with, which may uh, become something uh, more prevalent. So one example is the MakerDAO phishing attack, and that is a that's the first example of a Web3 uh, phishing scam. So you think that you are exchanging Psi to Dai. Um, you are interacting with MetaMask, or so you think, you're putting in your keys, and then bam, all your coin is stolen. So this is something that uh, was reported early in the year and something potentially we'll see in the future. The Justin Sun, Sun uh, a deepfake scam, that was fascinating. Someone essentially recorded a, a video of Justin Sun uh, making doing some kind of a investor scam trying to get people to send money to this unknown ent entity and they play that video on a skype call complete with uh, justin cuffing and it looks very real and also very fake and strange at the same time they faked his passport to show for some reason uh if you if you want to search that on youtube it's a fascinating video to watch we're still, it's still not something that was successful, but uh, it's kind of fascinating that scammers are even exploring uh, deep fakes for, for that purpose. Uh, the last example is, is the trust wallet scam. So uh, we see just a barrage of backdoored fake wallet software everywhere on, uh, if you search on Google, if you search in the app stores. What's interesting about this case is not the wallet itself, it's how it was addressed, which is, uh, a security researcher uh, was able to actually attack the infrastructure, a fairly broken infrastructure on the attacker side to start recovering the funds. And this is an interesting trend of basically folks taking things into their own hands to 
help users. Uh, so a quick note about the bad actors. So we already talked about the individual attackers. So the Twitter folks, you know, three were already arrested, uh, one in Florida, one in UK. Um, so we'll call them lone wolf type attackers. Uh, insider threats such as Kasha employee who got malware in their machine and uh, was uh, unfortunately resulted in, in funds loss. Um, let's talk about APTs. So we're we're familiar with uh, Lazarus Group, so that's a North Korean APT, um, and a whole variety of financial ransomware groups who basically attack anything with financial gain. What's interesting this year is the CryptoCore APT, which is our very own dedicated cryptocurrency exchange um, uh, advanced persistent threat. So with a bull market uh, maybe happening and sometime in the future, uh, and the renewed interest, I, I will see, uh, we'll, we're probably gonna see more dedicated groups like this as this becomes highly profitable enterprise. So some insights. Um, one is that users are taking things into their own hands. Uh, so we have Waz who's suing YouTube for being too slow at taking down the giveaway scams. We have Michael Turpin suing AT&T uh, to basically compensate him for, the, for, for allowing the SIM swap to happen in the first place. We have researchers like Harry Denley uh, reverse hacking uh, scammers to get users' funds back. While it does sound good on one hand that you know people are, are really pushing, they're, they're uh, fighting back against the scammers, I really wish the industry was more mature and we had enough uh, tools on one side, but also user education and guidelines and other uh, security controls available that not as many people would get compromised in the first place. MLM schemes are incredibly profitable. So this year, out of all cryptocurrency scams, uh, basically 99% of uh, the take was the WO token, $1 billion scam. Um, in the past, uh, PLUS token with their uh, $4 billion take, I think controlled uh, a whole 1% of the total Bitcoin supply. So these things are incredibly profitable and will definitely continue. Uh, an interesting trend that exchanges are proactively blocking bad addresses to protect their users. So there's always debate of centralized storage versus decentralized storage. That's something that uh, that was interesting to observe uh, this year is that exchanges like Coinbase, they were basically blacklisting the, um, the attacker addresses immediately to save uh, their internal customers' funds. Um, this is something that could be decentralized as well if you're looking for a project to be able to um, alert users of, of doing some kind of unsafe action. And I, I believe a few projects like MyCrypto are in fact doing that already. Scammers are getting more creative. So, you know, the Web3 phishing sites and the uh, deep fake scams, this is fascinating to see. I'm not sure which how profitable they are yet, but if they do become profitable at one point, we'll see a very rapid rise of them. So to summarize, the state of blockchain security um, insights that we've seen so far, uh, we talked about the exchange security, um, the number of hacks and financial damage is decreasing. That's great. Um, on the other side, existing incidents could have been easily prevented. Attackers are going after more than just coins. They're going after PII, they're getting creative. On the asset side, low hash rate GPU mineable proof of work coins are getting 51% attacked will continue getting 51% attacked. Uh, there was a first example of a proof of stake attack and it was very efficiently executed. Um, we're not finding nearly enough node wall vulnerabilities. I think there's an opportunity there to, for independent security researchers to really start looking at that. Uh, nasty backdoors and supply chain attacks against nodes and wallets. Um, again, if you can backdoor a node, you can attack the whole coin as the whole ecosystem. You don't have to go after individual people and you can take uh, basically the whole asset down. So this is highly dangerous, highly critical to start looking at. DeFi vulnerabilities are unfortunately on the rise and so are the attacks as the, the whole ecosystem is becoming more popular. On the user side, I don't see any new threats which are suddenly popped up. Um, it's just a consistent threat from miners, ransomware, fake software, um, and scammers are still sticking to giveaway scams and MLM schemes. 
they're getting more creative here and there, but they, I mean, the, the giveaway scams unfortunately still work. So an opportunity here is to work on more user education to see if we can um, make users a little bit more secure. So we've seen what the issues are. We've seen what the problems are. Here and there, I dropped some ideas of what you can do to contribute to the field, make it more secure. But really, uh, we can look at it more holistically and think of, of the blockchain security as just a standalone industry of, that we can build up together, we can grow in terms of maturity, education, projects, uh, and so on. So some things, some ideas that I'm going to cover of what we can do is we can talk about the guidelines and tools, uh, how we can develop those. We can talk about growing the community and specifically you. What is it that you can do today to start applying and contributing to this field? So on the guidelines and tools side, there are a few uh, amazing projects that are available. So on the consensus diligent folks there, they keep on publishing uh, a variety of software to test smart contracts. They publish the SWC, smart contracts weakness classification registry, where you have a listing of top vulnerabilities, uh, give you a good understanding of like what they are, how to prevent them. Trail of Bits folks, they're publishing tools one after another. They have the Slither, Echidna. They published a document this, uh, basically summarizing findings from um, all of their uh, smart contract security assessments. What are the trends? What are the top issues to look out for? Open Zeppelin essentially defined the field of how to write secure smart contracts. I'm seeing a lot of the newer projects. They're just basically verbatim adopting Open Zeppelin, Open Zeppelin templates, and they're very secure as a result. Other projects like Securing, they published the uh, Smart Contract Security Verification Standard. Um, NCC Group published an OWASP style list, top 10 list uh, back in 2018, but unfortunately it wasn't really maintained for a while. So it would be interesting for them to um, give new life to this project. Uh, another one is the Cryptocurrency Security Standard. And this one is interesting because if you notice all of the previous things that I mentioned, they have to do with smart contracts and Ethereum. This is the only standard and project out there which attempts to talk about more about the like how to securely generate keys, how to securely store keys in the cold storage. I would love to see this project growing and having a larger impact on, on the security of exchanges and nodes and wallets and so on. Um, guidelines and tools are important. If we are to grow this industry, we need to have uh, large collections uh, readily available for anyone who wants to contribute to this field to be able to quickly learn from the mistakes of the past. On the smart contract side, I think we're pretty solid. Uh, we have great tooling, we have methodology, we have a variety of companies and consultants who are available to test your smart contracts. So even though the, there are a lot of DeFi issues which are getting discovered, but there's enough uh, tools and folks that are experts in this field that can address this trend very quickly. On the other hand, we're missing uh, core guidelines, core methodology, and practically no tools to address uh, standalone blockchains. Um, how, if, if someone wants to build a new project, what is, a, what is a good resource that they can read and learn about the failings of the past and how they can uh, learn and correct whatever future designs that they're building. No configuration operation. Uh, nodes are at the core of any blockchain project. If, if nodes at some point start having more and more vulnerabilities discovered, then this breaks down everything that is built on top of them. Hot and cold storage security, key management, protocol design, wallet design, um, innovations in blockchain forensics, and also uh, user security, how to educate users and give them simple guides on how to avoid spam, uh, scams, how to give them tools to quickly protect them against going to bad websites like Google browser style. It's like, this is dangerous. Don't send to this address. Uh, one thing that I will be covering later in a separate talk on attacking and defending blockchain nodes is I'm trying to create an OWASP top 10 style listing of what you can do to secure your node infrastructure. Um, but I invite all of you to pick out any one of those items in the list, or if you imagine that you have more uh, things to, uh, to contribute to this field and start writing documentation, start writing tools. There's, there's an entire field available that you can develop and work with. On the community side, well, here we are at the blockchain village. 
there are three other conferences which are also available that you can attend, hopefully virtually, uh, throughout the year. Um, but I, I wonder if there should be more. I imagine that as the community grows and this field grows, we're going to see more and more of these. We have our own competitions. So we have uh, this year, I believe, uh, Victor is hosting a, a blockchain investigation competition. Last year, we had the Capture the Coin and Chain Heist. There are some challenges which are ongoing, such as uh, Open Zeppelin's excellent Ethernet. So this is great. On the knowledge sharing side, we have a variety of resources. So you can go on Telegram, Reddit, Discord here for DEF CON, and you can talk about uh, blockchain security. Uh, some newsletters that are also uh, working on distributing, disseminating knowledge. So the one that I'm writing is Blockchain Threat Intelligence. Um, where I try to cover what every every piece of news that is related to this field, um, not just related to smart contracts, but just holistically, exchange security, malware, uh, user scams, and all of that. Um, dil consensus diligence, they're running an excellent smart contract security newsletter. So if you want to raise your focus on Ethereum and layer two security, uh, this, is, this is the resource to subscribe to immediately. We even have our own shitty movies. So we have crypto where we have uh, you know, AML officer hunting down and investigating blockchains to bring down Russian mafia and the money plane. I'm not sure exactly what's happening there. I think the plot is they're hacking crypto on a plane, which is a fortress and a casino. Point is, we have our movies, we have our media. This we made it officially. This is great. So some community insights. We're still a very small but growing community with unique competitions, gatherings, chat rooms, challenges tools, projects, and so on. Uh, our community should and will continue growing. What's exciting to see is blockchain security or BlockSec becoming a career option. Even today, you can look on the internet and you can find jobs to do smart contract security testing if you want to. You can do blockchain security, engineering, so building projects, securing projects. Uh, cryptocurrency forensic analysis is, on, is going to be even more in demand after the Twitter hack. More people will try to um, exercise this new skill set. So this will, I'm hoping this will grow in the future. Uh, the point is, I want to invite you, I want to invite you to contribute to this field. Uh, so if you enjoy learning about the nitty gritty technical details, consensus negative smart contracts, great, join BlockSec, contribute to this field. There's plenty of things to explore and do here. If you're a security professional and you're just tired of finding yet another XSS or SQL injection bug, you want to find some cool new things which are just not fully explored yet, basically be able to define the field, great, join BlockSec. There are plenty of bugs that need to be found and patched by you. Are you an investigator who is trying to hunt down the fraudsters, wants to understand like how the hell do we track down uh, fraud and bad guys on, on the blockchains? Great, join BlockSec. There are plenty of blockchain analytics companies out there. Um, there's There's growing a body of investigators who are now capable of doing those tasks, join them. This is, this is very interesting. Uh, finally, if you're a developer and you're just looking for an exciting new project and you really want to make an impact on the open financial system, making that system more secure, contributing it to, to be more trustworthy by the people using it is a good way to, to help bring it about. So with that, join BlockSec and thank you very much for your time.